This podcast is brought to you by Knowledge at Wharton. Please visit knowledge.wharton.upenn.edu for more information. Days before the government stepped in to rescue Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, Knowledge at Wharton chatted with Mark Zandi, the chief economist and co-founder of what is now Moody'sEconomy.com, about his new book, Financial Shock, a 360-degree look at the subprime mortgage explosion and how to avoid the next financial crisis. Mark Zandi, chief economist and founder of Moody'sEconomy.com, has a new book about the subprime mortgage crisis, Financial Shock. Knowledge at Wharton talked to Zandi about his findings, today's economic conditions, and what should be done to get out of this crisis and avoid another. Welcome, Mr. Zandi. It's good to be here. The uh, subprime crisis is one of those things that has unfolded piecemeal and has taken over a year and a half, and some elements of it started much earlier. And now we have your book, uh, which puts it all into one place and describes it all and provides a lot of uh, additional data and insight that we haven't had before. And I'm curious that in, in researching this book, uh, what you ran across that really surprised you beyond what you knew from having followed the whole story as it was unfolding? Right. Well, uh, many things surprised me, but uh, the most fundamental level was the, uh, just how egregious the, the lending had become at the uh, peak of the housing boom. It wasn't just simply uh, making loans to people with low credit scores. It was making loans to people with low credit scores with uh, no down payment uh, or down payment assistance with no proof of uh, income uh, and uh, just enormous amount of risk layering that was going on. You know, I had a sense that obviously underwriting standards in the mortgage industry had fallen. I had no concept uh, to what degree they had declined. And that, that's a bit surprising f- to me because many of my uh, clients are in the industry. Uh, they're mortgage companies, uh, mortgage in- insurance companies, the Fannie Mae's and Freddie Mac's of the world. And I thought I had a pretty good understanding. I thought it was bad, but I, I had no uh, understanding of how bad it really was. And, and this refers to things like the no-doc loans or liar loans, as people came to call them, and the 100% mortgages, and this sort of eroding of underwriting standards that were supposed to be the, the safety net that kept these things uh, from collapsing. Yeah, exactly. I mean, if, if you go back early in the housing boom, say 2004, uh, maybe early 05, uh, the extent of the lending was, uh, aggressive lending was just giving loans to people who had problems making payments on other kinds of credit, bad credit scores. Uh, but the lenders would require a pretty sizable down payment and certainly proof of income uh, and a stable job. By the end of 2005 and into 2006, uh, all of that had just evaporated and lenders weren't checking anything. Uh, they weren't, uh, weren't even doing appraisals on the property. So uh, it was uh, really the wild, wild west uh, to a degree I, I did not know and could not have imagined. Just to go back a second, one of the, one of the things that happened in the, in the build up to all of this was that, that you mentioned in the book in some detail and that other people have talked about is this period when risk was, seemed non-existent and, and that risky securities like uh, junk bonds and emerging market debt and some of these mortgage-backed securities were, were trading at prices that offered yields that provided almost no risk premium at all. And, and apparently that was a mispricing that we now know that right. they were much riskier than people thought. The two questions, which is what caused people to be so sanguine about risk? And where do we stand now? Are we, are we overestimating risk? Have we gotten too nervous? Or uh, is it just impossible to tell what risks are? Well, in part, uh, there was a fundamental reason for this optimism, and that it goes to the global economy itself. Uh, the ups and downs in the economy seem to be moderating. It was called the uh, great moderation. And there are some good reasons to believe that our economies are more stable than in the past. And so if you have a more stable economy, then uh, it makes uh, risk premiums for financial securities. Uh, make, it's, it's logical to expect that they would come in and wouldn't be quite as wide. You're just not going to have big recessions and big bankruptcies and lots of credit problems. So you don't need as much of a risk premium. So there, I think, is a good sort of fundamental explanation for it. But I think I, I got carried to an extreme, uh, and people started, in a sense, forecasting with a ruler. And you know. Uh, and, and most forecasting is done that way. If, if the price of something... Line's going like this, it'll keep going like yeah, that. Yeah, if right. prices rose last year by 10% and they rose 10% the year before that, 
what do you think the price increase is going to be next year? 10%. Right. And so you start building that into your forecasting and, and uh, you tend to take more risk uh, in response. The third thing is there was just a lot of, of, uh, of uh, liquidity, a lot of cash. You, you can remember uh, liquidity reigning everywhere and there's a lot of discussion as to you know, what drove that. Uh, part of it was very aggressive monetary easing back earlier in the decade. Uh, it was also related to the fact that we have this very large current account trade deficit. So we're pumping out dollars buying goods produced overseas, and that's putting dollars out there to be invested, uh, and that provided a lot of liquidity. And so money managers, investors, uh, had lots of cash, lots of liquidity, and they have to put that to work. Uh, they just simply can't uh, put it on the sidelines and wait for something bad to happen. They could do that maybe for a year, but if in that year prices rose 10%, they can't do that in year two because no one will invest with them. They'll say, what the heck are you doing? I gave you my money to, make, to put it to invest it in whatever it is you do, and now you're not doing that. So in that, the, the, the professional money managers, the, the folks that were taking these, these global investor dollars and, and uh, funneling it uh, through these, uh, these, these, uh, these investments, really felt like they had no choice. They actually felt uncomfortable. I have many money managers as clients. They, they just knew that this wasn't right. But it didn't feel right. You know, you, you go to conferences and everyone's hand wringing that this this doesn't make sense. But that doesn't matter because I've got cash to invest and I'm gonna I'm gonna have to invest it. And so they were they were they were willing to accept a, a, a infinitesimal risk premium for buying emerging markets. They want to add one asset class to, to the next, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you you look for. First thing you got there's a ripple effect. Yeah, out. because yeah. I, I, you, know, you buy one asset, uh, the risk premiums come in. Then you go, okay, well this asset has a higher risk premium, so let me go invest in that. That risk premium comes in, and then you know at the peak, you know going back to 2006, end of 2006, early 2007, right before the financial shock, risk premiums on everything: junk corporate bonds, uh, mortgage-backed securities, uh, commercial mortgage-backed securities. Uh, 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 investments in, in direct investments in property, everything, all the risk spreads were as narrow as they have ever been. It seems to me that a lot of people in this circumstance would, would kind of, you know, draw the line at what went wrong here as the, the, the innocent bystanders who was hurt. All of us who did not take out crazy mortgages and see our home prices fall or see our stocks fall, that sort of thing. So what, you know, where sort of along that continuum, you know, uh, would would the, should the proper amount of regulation be? What should its goal be? Just to protect the innocent or to, to guide the markets more you know, in, in, a, in a deliberate fashion in a certain direction? Well, you know, my view is that uh, it's important to set down some basic rules that, uh, that uh, you need certain levels of capital and these are the ways you measure capital and these capital levels need to be uh, uh, equivalent across all financial institutions. Uh, that the entire credit risk in the financial system is at least being monitored so that everyone can see it and we have something palpable that we can measure and have a, an understanding of well is the risk level of risk rising or the level of risk falling we need to have rules that increase transparency we talked about transparency in the, in the trading of securities but also in terms of the balance sheets of the institutions that are in our financial system so you know i think it's 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 not saying that this is a bad mortgage loan or this is a good credit card loan or there's some basic things we might want to lay out with regard to that like don't make a mortgage loan to someone you don't think who can repay you that makes sense to me but it's pretty basic but uh, it's not it's not as much that as it is you know sort of the basic rules of the game and have a regulator that can sort of watch over the entire system as opposed to just a part of the system and a better sense of knowing what's going on and just having the information. I mean, I'll end it this way. We still don't know, really don't know, how many people are being foreclosed on. No one knows. And that's not the fodder of good policymaking. Well, let's come back next year and talk about it again. I would appreciate it. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you very much, and Thank good you. luck with the book. Thank you. For more information, please visit knowledge.wharton.upenn.edu.